What would happen if every single person on Earth took the time to write out all of their thoughts for just one day? And if we were to read this back to ourselves, what would we find? A lot of us would see that most of our thoughts are made up of judgments and a whole lot of projecting. I had never heard this until friends started pointing out to me that I do this quite a bit. I'm Rangya Dube, and welcome to How to Be Less of an Asshole, a channel where self-awareness is the only answer to our problems. This podcast aims to look at human behavior through the lens of history to better understand how we've become the people we are today with hopes of inspiring you to do the same. Recently, I talked with my friend Kirsten about a story she told me a few weeks ago when a much younger girl was at our local pool hall, and she was very territorial of all the men in the room. Kirsten's self-awareness about envy and jealousy made me wonder if I do the same. In today's episode, we will talk about this incident and what we can all learn from it. Do you remember what you saw in yourself that day when you told me about that young girl? Mm. I do remember us having this conversation. I kind of want to take a guess at it and see if what I said then is the same as what I say now. Because when it was very fresh, it might have felt different than what it feels like when it's not so fresh. I do remember, just to, just to explore the idea, I do remember what, that when I was young, I wasn't comfortable putting on clothes that were revealing at all. Like if I did, I would often take them off and change into, like if I put on a V-neck shirt, I would often feel icky and I would take it off and then put on something that covered up more of my skin. Um and I think that that was, for me, um, a process of transition from living in a child's body to living in a woman's body. And that maybe for me, there was almost a feeling of jealousy that I didn't experience my own body in the same way when I was 18 or 19 years old, that I didn't feel so free and liberal to express myself in that way. So I guess that would qualify as projecting, but... What I'm wondering is when we judge someone, is it the same as projection or projecting something on them? Hmm. I think there's some very distinct connections. So I think that when we are judging the actions of someone else, we are seeing that within ourselves. And when we don't distinguish that, that's when it gets messy. And we can't take responsibility. And so then we project. So does the projection happen when we're telling someone something about themselves that we deep down know we actually do too? I don't think projection necessarily needs to be verbalized, like directly. Like let's say, for instance, I am feeling sadness. I'm feeling a deep seated sense of sadness. And you're feeling pretty good. Everything's going pretty cool in your life. Maybe there's, maybe I have like 80% sadness and you have like 4% sadness. And then we come together. And because I'm 80% sad, I'm picking up on your 4% sadness. And I'm like, Rania, you seem really sad today. That would be me projecting my sadness onto you. And for you, it's like, oh, really? Huh. I don't really see that in myself right now. But I don't think that it necessarily needs to be verbalized to be projection. I could just be relating to you as though you're sad and treating you as though you're the one who is sad because I'm not taking responsibility for my own sadness. And we can replace sadness with anger, with rage, with frustration, with any other version of any other feeling that we could potentially be having. So I don't think that it needs to be verbalized, but I do believe that you're correct in saying that an experience happens that triggers us to react in a certain way. So so the experience may be some external circumstance that happens. And then as a result of that situation, I subconsciously choose to be sad or frustrated or angry. And then I have a feeling around that, which I don't want to be responsible for because it's uncomfortable. And so then I project it onto you, which is like, me blaming you for the way that I feel about these circumstances that happen. So basically, we're doing this projecting thing because it allows us to not have to deal with our own stuff. Yeah, it lets us put the responsibility of our feelings onto somebody else. So I'm at the point that I'm really dissecting a lot of my thoughts. And 
I wonder if you can give me your opinion on what's the difference between observation and judgment. What is actually healthy for us to be doing? Is observation healthy? Are there any types of judgments that are healthy? Okay, let's see if we can make a bit of an analogy. So let's say I'm sitting on a park bench and I am watching people walk by. So the observer is the part that's watching. All the observer is doing is witnessing this thing happening. But then when I go, oh, I wonder where they're going. Now judgment has started. Oh, I wonder if they're on their way to a party. Oh, I wonder if they're on their way to work. Or maybe he's on his way to work and she's on her way to a party. Ooh, his boots that he's wearing are really ugly. Ooh. And I wonder who cuts his hair. Gosh. Oh, but she has a nice haircut. Judgment, 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 judgment. But the part that just sees them going by, witnesses them going by, before any thought starts to happen, witness. And then if the thought starts to happen and we're still watching, so we're watching the thought, witness. Engaging in the thought, judgment. The watcher doesn't do, it just is. The judgment is doing. The judgment perpetuates. And then likely we'll, we would take action on that. For example, stand up, walk over. Excuse me, I noticed that you have a really nice haircut. Who cuts your hair? Now I'm going to switch hairdressers and go and see this person instead. So now action has been taken as a result of that judgment. But the part of ourselves, which is simply the consciousness or the awareness or the witness or the observer, is the part that all it's doing, it's not doing, it's what it's just witnessing, it's not participating. When you start observing all the judgment instead of participating in it, you quickly realize how much energy we're spending as a society arguing with one another. We're wasting so much time doing this. So what could we try to learn to try and understand the people we disagree with instead of wasting all of this time and energy trying to change them? I think there's a level of discernment that we're not super great at on the whole. My teacher always says, whatever question you ask him, he says, you should read the Bhagavad Gita more, you should meditate more. Those are the two answers he always gives. Can I just ask, what is discernment? Uh, well, and that's a good question. I don't I don't know if I'm really qualified to to give that a, a good answer, but I'll, I'll, I'll give a kick, kick at the hand, give it my best shot. So I think that judgment can be very reactionary and rooted in wounds and trauma. Whereas I think discernment is more slow to react and it's rooted more in experience and wisdom and more truth, not so much actions that we would take because we're hurt or wounded, but more actions that we would take because we have a broader understanding or because our awareness is a little bit more developed. So I think there's some distinct similarities between judgment and discernment. I think discernment is like kind of a more grown-up version, a more mature version or a healthier version, where we have a little bit more data to draw from and we and also a little bit more humility. I think that when we react based on our judgments, that there's that humility is not at play. So we're not coming from a place of being humble. We're judging and then reacting based on our judgments, thinking that we know, thinking that we have the answers, thinking that we know better than the others involved. Whereas discernment, I think, is more, um, I've collected this data, which has taught me these things that are somewhat rooted in compassion, forgiveness, and understanding, and also I'm putting myself on a, an equal plane. So a lot of us, I think, have a superiority complex or an inferiority complex that influences how we behave in the world. And I, I think they're kind of the same thing. I think that a superiority complex and inferiority complex are rooted in lack of self-worth. They just manifest differently. Whereas um, discernment is coming from a place where everyone has equal value. 
And so instead of putting myself above everybody else or below everybody else, which I think both kind of manifest as a sense of arrogance, with discernment, I realize that I'm a child of God just as everyone else is a child of God and we all deserve respect. And so then my actions that I choose based on my judgments are acted out of respect and also rooted in humility. I'm not sure what we were talking about the other day, but someone was being judgmental about someone on TV or a politician. And the first thought that I had now that I'm aware of my own shit and what I'm dealing with every day, I just said, you know what? I have the same capabilities as that person to be a total asshole. And so who am I to judge that person? And at the end of the day, everyone is just trying to do their best with what they have. So it's a lot easier to just think that instead of vocalizing judgmental thoughts constantly. The other thing I thought when you were speaking was having the curiosity that's needed to want and try and understand what someone else is going through and maybe even having compassion for them. So would being more curious lead us to being less judgmental? I think when we own our own shit, we've gone through the process of breaking down our our judgments enough to see them for what they are and then we can own our own shit and then we're less inclined to concern ourselves too much with um, what other people are up to or passing judgment on what they're doing. Yeah, because we realize we have enough stuff of our own to worry about and we don't necessarily need to be worrying and telling other people what to do because at the end of the day, if I sit with myself and pay attention to all of my shit, that in itself is a full-time job. And it's ineffective anyways. Like for me to tell you what you're doing wrong and the direction that you should be going in to to fix yourself, it's ineffective. You're not going to integrate that information. You're not, not in a, not in a healthy way. Although on the other hand, looking at my own stuff, it is effective because there is actually something that I can do about it. And I'm the only one who can see that the whole, all the aspects of that. So for me to tell you, Rania, Rania, you're doing it wrong. How do I know? How can I know that? I can know when I'm doing it wrong because I can check in with my body and my body will tell me you're doing it wrong, but I can't check in with your body. So I can't tell if you're doing it wrong. So there's for me to say that, but uh, but I have to have gone through a process of being smashed apart by the traumas of this world to realize that I have no idea whether you're doing it right or not. And there is no way for me to tell. The only The only place I can look for those answers is within myself for my own situation. So it's futile for me to pass judgment on you even though I do it anyways. We all have to experience it ourselves to learn the lesson because even when I tell myself the same thing over and over, I keep doing the same thing wrong. And it feels like I have to do it wrong so many times before I finally learn the lesson. And it's the same with people butting in. Like my family, for instance, we love getting in each other's business, but the more they tell me to do something, I'll just go do the opposite because I don't want anyone telling me what to do. And it's the same as a society. It's like, hey, people, the more you tell others what to do, I'm pretty sure they're just going to do whatever they want and go against what you're telling them. So maybe it's time that we just mind our business. And there is a quality of rebellion within all of us. And sometimes that, you know, sometimes we'll ask, we'll ask, well, what, what, what should I do? And I think we we ask that question so that we can rebel against the answer sometimes, just to like prove them wrong or something, or to prove ourselves capable or something, something twisted. Yeah, it's definitely not something healthy. And it goes back to something we've spoken about before, that we have to learn to let each other find our way, that we each need to figure out where we need to be going. But there's still a part of me that wonders, when is it okay to speak up? Because I'm living in limbo at the moment because I'm so aware of my thoughts and analyzing things a bit too much. 
And I keep thinking, when is it okay to speak? Should we be asking people if they want our opinion? What should we be doing better? Um, I know that sometimes people take a break from talking all together for a while. Um, I have. I've taken a a 10-day break. I've taken a four-day break. I've taken a 14-day break. Um, And there's some pretty magical stuff that can happen in that time when we take a break from talking. Things that I, I didn't realize my brain was capable of doing. I have a friend who grew up outside of London and she's, you know, she's almost 50 now, but um, she's only been living in Canada for, I don't know, 15 or 20 years. She still has a very strong British accent. And when I was on my 10 day break, I could hear her talking inside my head and it was her voice, not me, like not me recreating her voice. It was actually her voice in my brain. And I was like, I didn't know. I, I didn't know my brain was capable of doing that. But I needed to be like eight days into 10 days of silence for my brain to actually be able to, or my imagination, I'm not sure which part of my brain it was, but some part of my brain could make her voice talk inside of my head exactly the way that she would. And I think it was her as opposed to someone else because she has a very strong British accent. So it was distinct enough that I could recognize, wow, Joanna's talking inside my head. I wouldn't, an obscure um, example, but I wouldn't have been able to gain that knowing or achieve that knowing about myself had I not taken those first eight days of silence to get me there. And so I think there isn't really any right or wrong answer to your question. And also in saying that, I think it's a great thing to explore. I think it's a great thing to be curious about, like, what does it actually look like and feel like to be me living inside of this body when I'm choosing not to engage verbally in the world for a period of time? What happens when I do that? Yeah, I also see it in myself because the less and less opinions I have and the more I practice being aware of this, I've come to realize how exhausting it is to argue and judge people all the time. And now I just prefer keeping a lot of my opinions to myself because I always say, is it worth having an opinion about this because you're going to have to go read all of this stuff to make sure that you know what you're talking about. And maybe I'm also just being lazy, but there is a part of it that's self-preservation and an energy thing. And the more that you become aware of your body, you realize that this judging and arguing with people, if you check in with your body, it's not worth it when you actually take the time and realize what it's doing to you. I think it's important for us too to recognize like what's the difference between repressing and suppressing our judgments, pretending that we're not doing them, pretending that they're not happening versus witnessing them, acknowledging them and letting them go. So repressing and suppressing them means that we're stuffing them down into our body, pretending I'm too good. I don't judge. I'm too good to judge. I'm better than that. They're still there. They're still happening. It's still, I'm still doing it. I'm just stuffing it in and then it's going to make me sick versus learning how to witness my thoughts, witness the judgments, recognize what they are and learn to disengage from them or know that they're happening and not be reactive with them. And then I also want to say that, um, my experience of being in silence. I've done both situations where the environment that I was in was meant to create, even though there were other people around, it was meant to create a situation where I was actually by myself. So mimic the idea that I'm out in the forest and I'm by myself. So I've done 10 days of silence in that kind of a situation. I've done 14 days of silence where I was still engaging in my world. So I was going to work I was going to the post office. I was going to the grocery store. I was going to the bank. I had people around me. I was living in a situation where there was five other people with me living in my house. Um, Some of the people that I was around knew that I was observing silence. I had t-shirts that said I'm observing silence. And so if someone didn't understand my behavior, I could show them my t-shirt and then they would be, oh, okay, I get it. Sometimes I didn't, I wasn't able to 
to use that as a tool. So sometimes I was in a situation where I was being being silent and the people around me uh, probably had judgments that I was being rude or inconsiderate because they didn't understand what I was doing. Um, And it is definitely a very different situation to be in a controlled environment that's meant to mimic me being by myself versus being participating in the world um, from a place of silence. Two very different experiences. I often tell people that I don't want to talk about politics or any of the trigger topics of the modern world. And people have so much trouble respecting my boundaries. The more that I understand judgments and why I'm doing it, the more I also think, should I really have an opinion about something I don't really understand? And that's where it comes from a lot of the time. If I'm going to sit down with people and have these discussions, it means I'm going to have to spend a lot of time learning about stuff to have an opinion. And I'm at the point where I don't want to put my energy into something that I don't think I'm interested in, but also taking the time to think about these things is not important to me. And and what's that determining point where you've collected enough information to justify your opinion? Where's that threshold? Like at what point do you say, okay, I now know enough about this subject to be really rooted in my opinion? Who who determines what that threshold point is? And how do you know that that your determination of that threshold point is accurate? Going back to the idea of what we could be doing differently, I think we don't go into discussions to change our own minds. We go in to judge and change other people's minds. I'm also really aware that if I can't talk about something and be open because I can feel where I'm putting up a boundary, where I know I'm not going to listen to the other person. So why would I even bother having this exchange? And there's a part of myself that knows better to go and talk to someone if I know I'm going to shut them down right away. One of my least favorite sayings in this world, I think, is curiosity killed the cat. And and the reason why I really don't like that saying is because I think it it's on a subliminal level. It is telling us, don't be curious because it will kill you. Um, and when we go into a conversation with curiosity, it's possible even that the topic we're talking about isn't even the item of curiosity. It's possible that we're going to use the conversation to get to know the person that we're speaking with better. It doesn't have to be like, okay, say it, let's talk, let's say that the conversation we're having is like the best way to make popcorn. Do you really care? Does it really matter if you know the best way to make popcorn? But can you use that conversation to get to know the person that you're conversing with better? Can you use that conversation and see from the conversation, is this person really rooted in their ways or are they a curious person? These are judgments, of course. But you may use this information as discernment. Do I, Next week, do I want to engage in another conversation about whether it's a good idea to cut your dog's hair or let your dog's hair grow long? I think it just goes to show that maybe we want to engage in conversations that improve our lives. And is it really about the content of the conversation? Like, okay, yes, it's nice to get people's ideas about like, this is how I make my nutritional yeast dressing. Oh, this is how I make mine. Right, great. But but ultimately though, on the grand scheme of things, is it about the content of the conversation or is it about learning to witness people's boundaries, respect people's boundaries? And it's about who you connect with There's certain people you can have conversations with about pretty much anything and you're going to be so much more open than with, let's say, our families or people we've known our whole lives because it's people that we know the most that we are less likely to be patient with. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a natural, um, I think it's psychology has studied that and, and learned and understands that that's a natural process. I think we should finish off on the part where we try to help people become aware of what they're doing 
when they're projecting or they're judging people. So what would be a good way for people to stop in their tracks and go, oh goodness, I'm being really judgmental or I'm projecting how I feel about myself on other people? How do we take responsibility for that? I think I, I want to borrow some information that Red Hawk wrote about in Self-Observation, where he makes reference to quantum physics and how quantum physics has shown us that the particles behave differently when they're being observed and when they're not being observed. So they got their double sl slit experiment and they can see that that the particles behave differently when observed and not. And he explains how as above, so below. So the human mind is the same. When it is not being observed, it is kind of like a wild monkey just being a jackass and flinging shit, sniffing its own butt, farting whenever it wants to, and all the things that monkeys, they just don't care. And then when the mind is being observed, it naturally moves towards behavior that's in right alignment. And so the difference that he is talking about here is um, a mind that meditates and a mind that doesn't. And so when we have no meditative practice in our life, there's nothing, there's no higher power watching. The mind is not accountable for its thoughts and it misbehaves. So when we have a regular practice of meditation, there's nothing else that we need to do. The simple act of observing ourselves of witnessing our own thoughts naturally produces change you know we say we know that if we exercise more and eat less we'll lose weight but knowing that doesn't make us do it so knowing that we're behaving badly doesn't make us change our behavior so there's nothing really to be done directly to recognize that we're judging and to stop this whole process of judging from happening. What we can do is we can meditate. And the act of witnessing ourselves slowly over time will cause that behavior to simply dissolve. And finding a way to notice, because I think what meditation does is you start realizing what you're thinking and what you're doing. So now when I pick up my phone and I'm about to open an app, I catch myself and I ask myself, what are you doing right now? And that's something that I'm now telling myself every day. There is a part of me that's scolding myself, which is probably not the best, but at least I'm practicing and noticing what I'm doing instead of letting my subconscious just do whatever it likes. And so that's something that we can all do every day when we catch ourselves having a crappy thought about someone's shoes or anything random like that, we can just get into the habit of asking ourselves like, hey, where is that coming from? Where, why am I thinking this right now? And now you're making the choice conscious. So when you pick it up and you're about to click the app, it's a conscious choice. Whereas before it was not. You didn't think, oh, I should, or oh, I shouldn't, or oh, I could, or oh, I whatever. Now you're like, do I want to actually press the button or do I want to go chop some carrots instead? And that's when agency really starts happening. So again, I really want people yeah. to be aware that we're all responsible for what we're creating and putting out into the world. And I know people feel helpless, but we've heard it all before. Be the person you want to see in the world. We get to make choices every single day. So choose wisely. Thanks for taking the time to listen. And please remember, being aware of how you view other people is directly related to how you feel about yourself. Trying to understand others is the first step to a calmer world. We'd like to thank the Pretties for providing the music for the podcast. And until next time, please remember, kindness is contagious. <laughs>